Howard Davies, who is the professor of the French school, in case we need to announce it as a French school, Sciences Po in Paris. Um, let me just read out briefly um, his bio, although I don't think uh, probably Professor Davies needs much of an introduction. Uh, he was, of course, formerly um, the uh, vi uh, do we call it vice chancellor of the uh, London School of Economics, director of the London School of Economics and Political Science, um, until uh, 2011, I think, if I'm looking at my notes correctly. Uh, prior to that, of course, he was the um, chairman of the Financial Services Authority in the UK's single financial regulator from 1997 to 2003. He's also an independent director of Morgan Stanley since 2004, where he chairs the Risk Committee, and he's also on the Risk Committee at Prudential, uh, whose board he joined in 2010. He's got a number of books out, um, which I'm sure many of you have already read, given the financial fallout of the last few years, and today he'll be talking to us about global financial regulation post-crisis, is the world a safer place? And I understand how he's going to speak for around about um, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A &A session afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Howard Davies to the podium. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daryl. It's nice to be back at um, the uh, LKY School. And if I could open this, we'd be in business. Right. Um, and uh, at the moment, um, there's one thing about this slide that people might uh, question even before we start. Um, and that's the word post, um, because, of course, we seem to be going back into the crisis just at the moment, uh, particularly, of course, in Europe and the travails of the Eurozone and the repeated attempts to find a way of calming the financial markets um, have been a, quite a preoccupation um, around the world. Um, I see it. Uh, as a last, perhaps vain, attempt on the part of Europe to convince people in Asia that Europe still matters, you know, that we can still make a mess of things, um, even if uh, we aren't growing I mean, uh, our economy and the centre of economic gravity is shifting rapid to, rapidly to the east. It still seems that we have the capacity to make a real mess of the world's economy. So, you know, I think that's something to hold on to. Um, it does seem to me that we are in, at the moment, a rather dangerous uh, condition. And um, I was reminded of the famous quote by Woody Allen, uh, who said, we stand today at a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other leads to total extinction. Let us hope we have the wisdom to make the right choice. And this is, uh, it seems, rather where we are in terms of the global economy uh, at the moment. Uh, in fact, uh, South Africa, and I was here at the, over the weekend at the Sentosa Round Table, and a South African, in attempting to capture how he saw things, said uh, that he preferred to quote Rudyard Kipling than um, Woody Allen, and his quote was, if you can keep your heads when all around you are losing theirs, you don't know what the bloody hell's going on. Um, because at the moment, uh, it really is a time uh, for panic. But although the Eurozone uh, turmoil is what is on the main front pages of the newspapers, there is an awful lot going on in the world of financial regulation. And we know that one of the causes of the financial crisis was uh, inadequacy in the global regulatory framework. Uh, it didn't pick up the emergence of huge global imbalances, or at least didn't pick up the implications of those global imbalances. It didn't pick up the extraordinary expansion of liquidity, the extraordinary explosion of credit, particularly in the United States, and on the whole did quite a poor job at constraining uh, financial markets. And we would hope that regulation uh, could do better than that. So since the crisis, a large program of overhauling the global financial system has been underway. And really, my subject this evening is to do a quick audit, if you like, of where we are on that program and ask the question whether we are getting towards a point 
where we can say, well, we've learned these lessons and the world is now a safer place. In fact, uh, this lecture this evening is taken from a course that I'm doing at uh, Sciences Po uh, on this particular subject, where, in fact, uh, I do uh, 12 two-hour lectures on it. Uh, but because, of course, uh, Asians pick up things much more quickly than us Europeans, uh, you're much smarter, better informed. Tonight I'm going to do it in one session. Uh, and I think, you know, although in Sciences Po it takes 24 hours, I'm sure that here we'll be able to do it in, well, perhaps only half that time. Uh, so I hope no one's got any plans for dinner because this could um, take uh, a little while. Actually, uh, I've agreed with Kishaw that I will uh, almost certainly come back during the course of the academic year and do some other bits of this course. So I've co collapsed the first part of it uh, into one session for you this evening. And what I'm going to do is to run quite quickly, um, in some cases in a rather headline form, through 10 areas where we are trying to improve the regulatory framework and just try to give you some headlines as to where I think we are. And if you want to look into it further, quite a lot of the references are in a book I published last year called uh, The Global Financial Crisis, Who's to Blame? I'm going to look at the architecture of financial regulation, which is a kind of political economy subject rather than a financial regulation subject. I'm going to look at the particular problems of banking. I'm going to look at the question of macroprudential regulation, whether we can devise a scheme of altering regulation in the light of credit conditions. I'm going to look at shadow banking briefly. I'm going to look at reforms in the US. I'm going to look at the whole question of too big to fail. Again, I'll have to do that in a headline way. Look at the question of derivatives, whether we've made them safer um, at credit rating agencies. A little diversion into European Union regulation and then end with something about the culture of regulation and whether that has been changed to become more perhaps intrusive and more effective in the past. So let's first look at the architecture of regulation. And that is what the old system, as I describe it, looked like globally. Um, this is the very simplified version um, of an enormously complicated set of relationships. You have down here the Basel Committee, IOSCO, which sets securities rules, and IAIS, which sets insurance, solvency requirements, etc. Um, they have a kind of relationship with the Financial Stability Forum, had, I should say, this is pre-crisis, which was established after the Asian financial crisis in an attempt to achieve some more coordination among regulators. You've got a bunch of bodies that settle accounting standard, which is, of course, the building block of any attempt to implement global financial regulation. You have the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central bank's central bank and the central bankers sitting in Basel, supposedly watching over the financial system through the Committee on the Global Financial System and the Committee on the Payments and Settlement System. You have OECD, which has responsibility for money laundering. Um, and then you have the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF and the World Bank are not, in the normal sense of the word, regulators. They do not set regulatory standards in the way the Basel Committee do, but they do have an important role. The IMF looks at the compliance that individual countries are operating in relation to the globally agreed standards. They come and look at countries and say, are they meeting standards? Um, before the crisis, they had done uh, all countries but two. One of those two was China, which had agreed to have a review, but it hadn't actually happened. And one country in the world took the view that its regulatory system was unimprovable and did not need any oversight from the IMF. And that country was not South Korea, no, the United States. Um, <laughs> they said that there was no issue. Why did the IMF want to come looking at their system, which was the most sophisticated there was? Uh, so that was the way it looked. And we learned in the crisis, although, of course, some of people involved in this knew before that, that there were all kinds of problems with the way this system operated. First of all, uh, it did not operate effectively as an early warning system. The, nobody was really there to raise the alarm 
about worrying trends in the financial system. So we saw huge expansions of credit, huge expansions in derivatives markets, massive global imbalances, excess liquidity, and a few of these committees kind of worried about it, but nobody said anything which caused anybody to act. The second problem um, was that uh, any reform to the system took endless time to agree. Uh, the Basel Committee reviewed the Basel capital regulations in the 1995-96 and decided then that there were some very significant flaws in the system, that it did not capture the relative risks of different types of lending properly and that it needed a significant fundamental overhaul. Twelve years later, Basel II was agreed um, but has still not been implemented. And now, of course, we're moving on to Basel III at a great rate. Uh, but the system had no kind of discipline within it. And the reason for that, I think, was that it was overcomplicated and there was no authority among these different regulatory bodies. The Basel Committee did not report to anybody, really. It was a group of regulators who worked together internationally and there was no kind of sense of urgency or any deadline by which anything had to be agreed. Also, uh, the membership of these bodies was unrepresentative and clearly out of date. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I, my last speech when I left the FSA was in Singapore and I made a speech, I mean, partly of course because I thought it would be, go down well with the audience, but I said that I thought these bodies were unrepresentative and needed to be changed. Um, it, the Basel Committee had 13 members, 10 of whom were from Europe. Um, and nobody apart from Japan, uh, from Asia. The whole architecture came under the G7. Uh, the G7 no longer uh, reflecting the nature of financial uh, activity. So uh, old-fashioned, nobody had the incentive to change it. It's a bit like in financial markets, it's the version of the United Nations Security Council problem, that somehow you have a system which was established after the last global cataclysm in 1945, and there never seems to be a moment at which it is revived. So it was unrepresentative, and that was serious because, of course, if large parts of the world are not at all represented in devising these rules, how can we expect them to be enthusiastic followers of them? The US was excessively dominant, um, and the, United, uh, the EU spoke with many voices. There was no coherent European Union view. And the system left too much scope for regulatory competition and arbitrage, so that there was a lot of evidence of different countries sort of undercutting each other in capital regulation or conduct of business regulation, um, which created a, an uncomfortable dynamic in the system. So these uh, points of view were, I think, perhaps, without, perhaps with the exception of this one, which the Americans uh, didn't agree, but most people came to some version of this view um, in the late 2008 and early 2009. And so largely at the London summit of April 2009, radical reforms to the system were agreed so that it now looks like this. Well, you may say not perhaps quite as radical as all that. Although I don't think one should downplay too much the changes that have been agreed. The key ones are that we now have at the top of the heap the G20 rather than the G7. We'll come on to what political uh, and financial significance that might have in a second. We have also the Financial Stability Forum, which was set up as a loose coordinating body after the Asian financial crisis, actually at the initiative of Gordon Brown, has now become the Financial Stability Board. What's in a name? You may say, well, not necessarily very much. It still does not actually have a treaty basis. It does not have any kind of formal legal entity uh, around it, actually. Uh, but the fact that it's called a board and the fact that the G20 now calls it to account at every summit and says, we want to report from the Financial Stability Board on what all the regulators are doing, has given it de facto authority. 
it now certainly does exercise some kind of discipline over the other regulators. So that while Basel II took 12 years to devise, Basel III uh, was done in about 18 months. And the Financial Stability Board explicitly has responsibility for assessing vulnerabilities in the system and does now produce rather pointed assessments of what's going wrong or right. It has responsibility for coordinating improvements uh, to supervision is, for example, promoting supervisory colleges of regulators from around the world focusing on the big global institutions, and it monitors the changes to and improvements in standards. So it has um, a more authority in the system than it had before, uh, and Basel uh, has significantly expanded its membership. So the unrepresentativeness of the big standard setters has been changed. So now Basel has membership of the uh, G20 uh, as well. So these are not trivial changes. You know, the, the part of the world that is now associated with the oversight of the global financial system is much, much bigger. That was how we tried to do it before. We thought that that was the world's financial system. Um, and, of course, that had departed from reality long time since. So that change is not without significance. It was, I think, inevitable. Indeed, I argued for it uh, some time ago. Uh, but, of course, it's taking a while to settle down because there was, of course, an advantage of a small club, the G7, of people with long-standing habits of cooperation and broadly compatible views, prepared to take a global view and used to taking a global view. Uh, but, of course, the disadvantage was many countries were alienated from that process. Now we do have a group which is much more representative of the global economy. There is undoubtedly enhanced legitimacy um, of global standards. You know, the Chinese are now strongly officially in favor of Basel III and are implementing Basel III. That actually does add to the weight of these standards. There's not many hiding places now, uh, apart from a few offshore centers, where you can be a big bank and not be compliant with these international standards. But of course, you know, over time, we'll just have to see how this works. How effective will it be at reaching agreement? And indeed, some people would argue that there are already signs that the initial enthusiasm for collective agreements in the financial area, which we saw in 2008-9, when everybody was terrified because you know, even the Chinese thought that their economy might start to uh, tail off, that you know, there was a, a sense that we were all in this together and we should agree things, that's a bit less evident um, at the moment. And over the last year or two, there have been quite a few signs of uh, reluctance to grapple with some of the outstanding uh, issues which are needed. So you know, one has to say uh, that this is going to require effort uh, on the part of the new members of these groups to work on being cooperative and collaborative. So uh, there are signs, as I said, that uh, things are not quite uh, going the way the Americans would like them to go. Um, you know, this is a remarkable comment just uh, uh, 10 days ago um, where uh, the you know, world's biggest banker uh, is arguing, or America's biggest banker, uh, that these rules are now anti-American. You know, and if you want to attack support for your... Uh, point of view in America, you know, you use phrases like anti-American, you know, um, and you can see now that there are signs of the US, which used to run this show, saying, hang on, you know, we don't seem to be in charge anymore and we don't like it. Um, and there are dangerous signs um, of the kind of consensus that you need uh, to build a safer system rather fraying uh, at the edges. Um, you may have seen this in the last day or two that um, there was an attempt by the banks to push back on some of the changes in capital requirements, uh, which uh, I think the Basel Committee have uh, resisted. Um, but, you know, that was an interesting sign. And the way this language was used, you know, was a sign that this is, this is politics. You know, this is not just technical stuff about risk-weighted assets. You know, there is big politics involved uh, in this issue. So 
that's where we are on the uh, part of the architectural change. The other one I said was that the Financial Stability Board had been given more responsibilities. Um, this is now its mandate, and it is, I think, uh, quite a comprehensive and a quite a sensible uh, mandate, you know, looking at vulnerabilities in the world economy uh, and going down to issuing early warnings uh, of trouble ahead. And that is, I think, a sensible mandate, but of course, we don't know how effective the FSB uh, will be at delivering uh, that mandate. Uh, so all of this is uh, good stuff, uh, but will it be enough? Well, there is an interesting, again, political economy question here about why it is that it is so hard in the financial system uh, to agree, uh, as it were, uh, super national uh, bodies. You know that in, in the trade in physical goods, uh, we have the WTO. Now, it's not the most rigorously effective body, but it has a treaty behind it. It has an enforcement process. You can appeal to the WTO if you think people are dumping uh, products in your markets. And there is, you know, an arbitration process, and eventually uh, there are sanctions. There is no such thing in the financial world. If you think that a bank is operating in your market not compliant with Basel standards, you know, uh, there's nothing you can do about it except try to kick it out. But that's the rather different. So it's a domestic enforcement mechanism, rather different from being able to appeal to uh, an international body to uh, oversee it. And yet, in spite of many attempts to do this, there's been no possibility um, of agreeing any kind of supranational authority. And it would appear that governments are remarkably more protective of the oversight of their financial systems than they are of uh, trade in uh, goods and services, which is it's quite difficult to explain, actually. Sorry, can I just ask you to quiet down? Sorry, it's just slightly distracting for me. Thank you. Uh, so let's move from architecture uh, on to the banking issues, which are probably uh, the biggest and most uh, important ones, where it was quite clear um, that there were major problems in the world's banking system. The IMF has rather helpfully uh, characterized the challenges, as they describe it, in the banking sector. If we begin at the top, a lot of uncertainty about asset quality. I mean, this was, in a sense, uncertainty about asset quality is a rather a polite way of putting it in relation to the subprime sector, you know, whether they were, these assets had any value at all. Uh, clearly, uh, in retrospect, we can see that leverage in the banking system was uh, too high. Uh, also, it became obvious during the crisis that there was a tail of weak banks, uh, and of course we've seen a number of them fall over uh, or be merged together, and that process is still going on in individual countries. Um, that uh, investors have been anxious about the quality of bank debt, partly of course related to the leverage. Uh, banks have found it difficult to fund themselves in the wholesale markets, um, and banks who rely extensively on wholesale markets to fund themselves have been under significant pressure. That, frankly, is the big problem recently about the French banks. I mean, they are much more reliant on wholesale funding of a relatively short-term kind than our US or indeed UK banks and have not reduced their reliance on wholesale short-term funding as much as banks elsewhere have done. And that makes you vulnerable to any kind of confidence issues that emerge in the, in the markets. And then uh, the one that has come to the fore most recently is uh, sovereign risks that, you know, that embedded in a lot of these banks, particularly in Europe, is a huge amount of sovereign debt. The countries who've been issuing large amounts of sovereign debt, a lot of that has found its way into the banking systems. Curiously, in some cases, for regulatory reasons, um, you know, there are regulations which say um, that banks should hold a certain proportion of their assets in the form of you know, the safest assets around, which are sovereign debt. Um, mm. Well, that doesn't look quite such a hot uh, calculation just at the moment. So these are the sort of complex of uh, issues uh, in the banking market, and how far are we getting on with them? Well, again, I'm going to be quite quick. Um, uncertainty about asset quality, well, our regulators are dealing with that by being much more rigorous about stress testing, 
um, and forcing banks uh, to be more aggressive in reserving against potential losses. And you know, that's all technical stuff. It's hard work from, uh, with, from bank to bank, with regulator to regulator, but it is being done. Leverage, well, that's where the central bankers and regulators of the world have now decided that banks need more capital and that the whole system operated with too little capital in the past. The big question, of course, is how much more capital do they need? Everybody says, fine, they all agree to that. But at some point, you, know, you constrain the system and you will make credit more expensive if you require banks to hold more and more equity. And at the moment, certainly in Europe, it's not at all clear who's going to buy that equity. Because particularly, if you're going to lose a lot of the equity because of write-downs on sovereign risk, this isn't a very appetizing prospect for an investor. Please buy my equity in order that I can take your money and use it to write down my Greek debt. Well, this isn't a very appealing prospect, and the chances are that the only investor that's going to do that with relation to the French banks is the French government. Uh, and that's why this whole complex of issues about sort of bank capital, sovereign debt is very complicated. And that kind of underlies the debates that are going on as we speak uh, in Europe and will be in the Bundestag today, where there's a crucial vote um, about the latest Greek bailout package. Weak tail of banks, well, new resolution and restructuring procedures have been agreed. Um, this is a tricky one, clarifying policy on private sector bail-ins. You know, people say, well, bank debt holders should surely share some of the pain, along with equity holders, of banks who have made really poor lending decisions. But actually, achieving that is technically quite hard. Reducing reliance on short-term wholesale funding. As I said, the Americans and the British banks have on the whole done that better than the continental Europeans. And that's kind of why the continental European banks are under more pressure at the moment. And of course, in Europe, the big question, the big horror, is the sovereign risk problem. You know, in principle, you can address in one of a number of ways. Uh, you can have consolidated European bonds with collective guarantees, but the Germans don't particularly want to do that. You can have massive austerity programs, but at the moment, that looks like you're chasing your tail because the more austerity you have, the lower your growth rate and then the higher your debt-to-GDP ratio. Uh, you can deal with it by having a big write-off, but if you do have a big write-off, then you're going to have to recapitalize the banks because the banks will have to take a lot of that burden, and that's going to be costly for them. So this whole complex of issues is, I think, still very, very uncertain. You know, some parts of the jigsaw you can see being reasonably clear in the future. We do have a new regime of capital, which I think, you know, with some struggling and shouting and uh, the odds from people like JP Morgan have broadly been agreed internationally. It'll take people some time to get there, of course. Uh, but some of these other issues are really still in the melting pot, I think. And we cannot be confident in this area uh, that we do have a safer system. The new Basel II had a three-pillar regime. The Basel III has a similar three-pillar regime, but a lot more uh, precision and a lot more discipline in the process. I mean, Basel II relied very heavily on banks' own internal models to determine what capital they had. There is much more external moderation of that process under Basel III, which is almost certainly an improvement. And the amount of capital that banks will have to have has gone up uh, significantly. It's probably easier to see it in the form of a, uh, a bar chart. But now banks have to have, in addition to more uh, hard-edged equity capital in their portfolio, they also have to have a counter-cyclical buffer to cope with ups and downs in the cycle. They have to have a capital conservation buffer. And if you're a big bank, you have to have a uh, systemic institution buffer. And uh, that's what the big argument with J.P. Morgan has been this week. And Basel is about to come out with a list of the institutions who are going to have to have uh, this extra bit uh, on the top, the, what's called the SIFI surcharge, the systemic international financial institution uh, surcharge. So Basel III is loading capital on banks' balance sheets in quite a significant way, which ought to make them more robust uh, in the future and less vulnerable to downturns. The second big problem in bank regulation was, in addition to the quantum of capital, was that the system 
did not well respond to the economic cycle. And one simple way of putting this is that as a regulator, when you went into a bank to try to decide how much capital it should have in relation to its portfolio, you had certain guidelines from Basel. And you went in, looked at the bank's book, and you said, OK, let's take that set of loans and ask ourselves how much you would have lost on that set of loans at the worst time over the previous 10 or 15 years or whatever you'd got a sensible run of data for. So if, you know, at the worst moment in the recession, the last recession, how much would you have lost holding that portfolio of, of loans? And then that's your basic minimum. Now, you add on a bit for luck because you don't want a bank to get down to zero capital at, you know, at any point in the cycle, so you aim for... But that's how you do it. Now, of course, if you have a long cycle, which we had before, and in the UK, for example, we had uh, 64 consecutive quarters of growth from um, Q2 92 to Q2 2008. That was a surprisingly long cycle. And basically, property prices rose during that period for 16 years, pretty much uninterrupted. So if you looked at a British mortgage bank in 2008 and said, well, how much capital would you have needed to sort of survive the ups and downs of the last 15 years? The answer is almost none. Uh, because they would never have lost any money because property prices kept on rising. So even if there were repossessions, uh, and there weren't that many because unemployment was relatively low, the economy was expanding, um, but even if there were, you know, they'd still get more when they seized the house and then sold it again, they'd probably get more than their loan. So the losses were minimal. So just at the point when the market's about to crash, the system told you that you didn't need any capital at all. So it was, it was kind of pro-cyclical, particularly in a long cycle. So the idea is to say, well, how do we take account of the state of the economic cycle, the state of credit creation, and in, in addition to what, you, what people are now calling micro-prudential policy, looking at an individual bank and saying, how much do you need? You have macro-prudential policy, which says, well, if asset prices are high, if you know, the ratio between house prices and incomes or whatever measure you want to take of asset prices, if, if that's you know, in high territory, then you know, surely there must be a higher probability of um, a change in that cycle. And therefore, at that point, we want to get you to increase your capital so that your capital requirements are counter-cyclical rather than pro-cyclical. That's the theory of it. And in principle, the framework for doing that's been agreed. Uh, I'll skip over that. But a lot of questions do remain. You know, how do you decide on precisely how big this counter-cyclical should be? And who decides when it should be imposed and how? Uh, Alan Greenspan's view always was that you could never forecast these things. That you, you know, there was no way. And the best thing central banks could do was just mop up the mess after a bust. But if you tried to sort of second guess where asset prices were going, you know, you would end up constraining the economy more. That is clearly a risk, but I think the balance of argument has swung in favour of those who say, well, you know, that may be theoretically true, but surely we can do better than we did in 2008. You know, surely um, we should have been tightening the system uh, when every signal was flashing red, as it was in the years up to the crash in 2007-8. Another important question, though, is how these decisions relate to monetary policy, because you may say, well, if that's what you think, if you think credit's expanding very rapidly and asset prices, why aren't you changing interest rates? Why isn't that the best answer? Uh, so there's a clearly a relationship between capital requirements and interest rate decisions, which is now being uh, worked through in a rather painful way in a number of different countries. So in this area, I think we've got a kind of framework. There's a new intellectual framework, but of course it is completely untested. I mean, we're certainly in Europe and the US anyway, absolutely nowhere near any tightening phase of policy. So, you know, whether we'll do better next time um, than we did last time, one can only, well, one can't answer that question at the moment, except to say that there is a different kind of intellectual framework within which these decisions were made. The next point is the whole question of shadow banking. This is the fourth of my 10 points. And if you look at uh, what happened in the US before the crisis, it was actually shadow banking that was expanding credit creation more rapidly 
than commercial banking. Um, what do we mean by shadow banking? Well, largely uh, in the US, we mean things like uh, securitization of mortgages and then selling them on, sometimes through special purpose vehicles. You remember the SIVs and the SPVs that people talked about a lot. Um, and then they are eventually held sometimes by another bank, uh, but sometimes by money market mutual funds or whatever. Uh, so that this is the process of securitizing debt and then finding ways of marketing that around the system through the securities and derivatives markets in one way uh, or another. And this is hugely uh, significant and was more significant in terms of credit expansion in the go-go years before the crunch uh, than the commercial banking system. But this is a very difficult problem uh, to get at. Um, the Financial Stability Board was instructed last November to strengthen the regulation and oversight of the shadow banking system. And they have a task force, um, and they are supposed to be putting proposals to the CAN Summit in November, trying to define shadow banking, which is not straightforward, trying to find ways of monitoring it, and trying to find ways of uh, addressing the risks of regulatory arbitrage. And this seems to me to be a, the big sort of unanswered question in the markets at the present time. And particularly crucial because it's fine to tighten the screws on the banks, but the higher capital requirements you impose on the banks, the greater the incentive to find a way of avoiding those capital requirements by creating credit outside the banking system. So, you know, we're creating more incentives for shadow banking, but we're not yet finding a way um, of addressing the systemic risk and the implications of regulatory arbitrage in that sector. So that's an area which is worth watching quite carefully, I think. There will be a report out, you know, within the next uh, month or so. Um, and, of course, it'll also have to take account of the fact that shadow banking emerges in all kinds of different forms in different places. Uh, the securitization and repackaging of loans that I described is characteristic in the US. At the moment in China, the main uh, feature of shadow banking, which is growing very rapidly in China, to the alarm of the authorities, I think, is non-financial corporates lending to each other. Um, because given financial repression in China with interest rates held down by the People's Bank, um, you know, you're a mug to put your money in the bank if you've got any other way of, of lending it. So corporates are not at all keen on putting their money in the bank. They would rather find another corporate that was short of cash and lend it to them. And actually, often their credit ratings are better than the banks anyway. So why not? But the difficulty from the monetary authority's point of view is that you then you know, kind of lose sight of what's going on uh, in terms of the amount of money and the amount of credit uh, in the economy. So this activity on shadow, but the regulation of shadow bank is going to be quite complicated because it takes very many different forms in different parts of the world. Now, fifthly, the US. Um, who are these two guys? Dodd and Frank, yes. Most people can't remember which is Dodd and which is Frank, but that's Dodd uh, and that's Frank. Um, and Dodd-Frank, of course, uh, was the name of the bill. And it's interesting to ask yourself how far Dodd-Frank has dealt with the many problems that emerged in the US regulatory system. Well, um, it's not through want of uh, writing volumes of legislation if they haven't done it, because there are 2,300 pages of legislation. People say no one anywhere has read them all, uh, certainly not Dodd or Frank. Um, <laughs> it has made a number of structural changes to the system with more powers for some regulators, and it's reformed the Federal Reserve System. Let's look at what it has done, and then perhaps a word or two about what it hasn't done. There are some new, there's a new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, part of the Federal Reserve, and this was designed to deal with uh, the problems that arose in the mortgage markets with predatory lending, effectively. There's an Office of Financial Literacy. Well, I'm all in favor of that, but it's not a neat, quick acting thing. It takes a long time to promote financial literacy. Probably the most important thing is a new Financial Stability Oversight Council, because one of the key problems in the US, which anyone who's looked into this knows, is that there are just loads of regulators. When I was the chairman of the FSA, I had, I reckon, 75 opposite numbers in the United States. Um, 
and uh, you know there are state regulators of insurance, not in every state, but a lot of them. Uh, there's the SEC regulating cash equities and the CFTC regulating futures and derivatives. No other country thinks it makes sense to do have to have cash and derivatives regulated by different regulators, but the US do. You've got several banking regulators you can choose. You can choose a state banking regulator, the Office of the Control of the Currency, the Federal Reserve used to be able to um, used to be able to. Uh, choose the Office of Thrift Supervision, but that has at least been abolished. Um, a new Office of Credit Ratings and an Office of Minority and Women's Institutions. I don't know what that will do, but um, that was tagged onto the bill in the way that American happens in a lot of American legislation. Um, and there are some new regulations. The Volcker Rule, which is prohibiting proprietary trading and direct investment by banks, Big arguments currently about that, about how the Volcker rule will be defined, how strict it will be in terms of constraining the risk-taking activities of banks that are uh, regulated by the Fed. Um, derivatives, a rather important point. Um, one of the problems that I think most people would accept was quite significant in the crisis was that many of the derivatives that were being traded were extremely complicated and very opaque. And therefore, when the market crashed and liquidity tightened, there was just no market in these things because people uh, couldn't understand them. They were very, very complicated. They were not standardized in any way. They were traded over the counter. And the normal assumptions people had about liquidity went out the window. There was no liquidity in these things. So the prices tumbled, partly because there was just no market in them. Um, and therefore, the idea is that in future, these derivatives will be pulled onto exchange and cleared on exchanges, which effectively will mean more transparency, people will be able to see what the trading is, and it will also effectively mean more standardization because it, it's hard to put all these things on exchanges if they're very, very bespoke. You know, they will have to be uh, more uh, tightly defined. Tougher on mortgage regulation. This is more of a kind of consumer protection thing, although, of course, subprime did uh, spread around the world. Firms will be required to submit what some people call living wills and other people call funeral plans, which is designed to um, show, produce a scheme for winding down an institution in the event of trouble. And this is because uh, the experience, for example, of trying to deal with Lehman Brothers, uh, where there will be litigation for the rest of my life, and almost certainly for most of yours, um, has been demonstrated that you know, when a firm like that uh, folds up, that the complexities of litigating the consequences are absolutely immense. And the idea is to find a way of rationalizing your kind of legal entity structure to make firms easier to resolve. And that's uh, quite important. Plus some changes on remuneration. You know, one of the other problems in the crisis was that remuneration structures, uh, in compensation as they call them in the US, were creating incentives for risk-taking which were out of line with the institution's declared risk appetite. And so they're trying to exercise some discipline on that with, say, on pay. In other words, shareholders voting on remuneration committee reports. Problem is that that's borrowed from the UK where it didn't make any difference at all. So we'll see how effective that is. Uh, the next issue, um, I apologise for going quickly, but that's the nature of the beast, is the too big to fail question. And this is, I think, a very interesting area where, frankly, there is, in spite of all of the debates over the last three or four years, no global consensus on what should be done about too big to fail. Now, the problem, easily defined, is that you get to institutions that are so big that governments cannot allow them to fail, and therefore, there is a kind of heads they win, tails we lose dimension to it. You know, if they take more risk, they will on the whole make more profit and pay themselves more. Uh, if it goes wrong, then the government uh, and the taxpayer will have to bail them out. Uh, so the question is, what do you do about that? Well, you know, obviously, more capital is one kind of approach. Uh, but even that, many people say, well, doesn't really deal with the moral hazard problem I described. Now, some people say, well, actually, this isn't really an issue uh, because um, universal banking does effectively allow risk diversification and that the notion that uh, 
the, you deal with too big to fail by kind of carving up, you know, going back to Glass-Steagall or whatever, is wrong. Actually, universal banks that do everything from capital market activity to uh, current accounts for retail customers are actually better diversified and less risky. Roughly, that would be the French proposition. I mean, uh, and the Germans too. I mean, you know, the Do Germans have no interest in breaking up Deutsche Bank. The French have no interest in breaking up Socgen and uh, BNP Paribas. And they take the view uh, that this is a kind of a non-issue or that it is an issue, but you deal with it just by increasing capital. There's no need for structural change. In the US, the general view now was, well, some people argued for going back to Glass-Steagall, you know, for carving up JP Morgan and saying, you know, it's back into a broker dealer on one side and a commercial bank on the other and never the twain shall meet. But the consensus reached in Congress was Volcker rule. In other words, not breaking them up completely, but preventing the most risky stuff, you know, the real proprietary trading stuff, the private equity and taking big positions in markets. And that if you could chop that bit off, you know, that would significantly reduce the riskiness of these institutions, which you had to accept, were so big that you would have to save them if they went down. In the UK, we have a different idea, um, uh, which is that you have a firewall around uh, retail and commercial banking. Uh, some flexibility about where the firewall precisely is, but within that firewall, you have a slightly higher capital requirement than Basel III, and you say explicitly that that is a bank you know, which the, has access to liquidity from the Bank of England and is, in principle, a bank which you know, is too big to fail. Um, but the rest of it must be in a separate entity um, and will explicitly not be uh, ac have access to lender of last resort uh, from the central bank. So Barclays will have to have Barclays, you know, retail and commercial bank, and Barcap will have to be a separate. Big question is, well, does the market believe it? Um, and if it does, well, then the cost of capital for Barcap will be significantly higher, um, which will make it less competitive. So there's a cost there. If the market doesn't believe it, then what have you really achieved? If the market says, well, actually, they'd have to bail, bail out Barcap, so what the hell? And that is a moot point, because on the whole, markets believe what, inst what governments do rather than what they say they do. Um, and, of course, what, what has happened is that governments have uh, bailed out uh, banks of all kinds. And uh, there are others still who argue for even stricter separation. And uh, I see the... Swiss ambassador here, so I need to be careful about what I say, but I don't think he would deny that this issue has once again come on the political agenda in Switzerland in the last couple of weeks, with quite a lot of Swiss politicians saying, you know, we've had enough of this, thank you very much, UBS, we just want to carve the damn thing up. We, you know, UBS can be a lit retail bank and a wealth manager, but all of this investment banking in London particularly has got to go. Now, quite where that debate will kind of end is not clear, but it's very clear that it will mean, you know, I think the bank have already made it clear that they will be reducing the size of their investment bank at the very least, and possibly, uh, possibly more than that. Uh, so this issue um, is uh, very difficult, and there is no consensus um, about it uh, at the moment. Um, but the banks themselves say, you know, well, hey, we're too big to fail, so uh, never mind. Um, but I think that is an issue which is uh, very interesting uh, to watch. Um, and it's quite remarkable, really, uh, that you know, countries with very similar institutions are reaching such remarkably different conclusions about it. Uh, the OTC derivatives point I mentioned briefly. I'm not going to go into it in any detail, but it's not proving terribly easy to achieve what appears to be quite a simple objective. And the US and the EU have produced separate, subtly different uh, definitions of what they want to do with the with um, uh, derivatives, uh, and that is causing some transatlantic tension just at the moment. Then there's the rating agencies. Well, what about the arguments there? Well, you know, uh, they've been criticized a lot, uh, that they're an anti-competitive oligopoly, that they gave AAA ratings to complicated securitizations, which they didn't understand the risks of. You know, the, 
figure that people often quote, I believe is actually true, that there were 12 AAA corporate credits in the US at the end of 2006, and 65,000 AAA securitizations. Um, and the rating agencies, in a cavalier fashion, put AAA ratings on things which they had no understanding of the dynamics of those securitizations in conditions of stress liquidity. Uh, it, people argue, uh, the rating agencies would disagree that they did it deliberately to get business from investment banks, um, that there is an inherent conflict in the system uh, because issuer pay uh, is the rule and the issuer, of course, wants the highest rating. So the issuer and the rating agency kind of work together to devise clever bells and whistles, including insurance from uh, what people like AIG, of course, turned out not to be able to pay, um, to create uh, triple A's from um, but triple B's, and uh, that uh, they have basically um, made things worse in the financial system rather than uh, making things better by spotting problems, which is what you might hope they would do. Well, uh, there is an attempt to deal with this um, that the EU has produced a directive which is quite rigorous, it's more rigorous than anything in the US so far. Um, and there will be much more transparency of the models and methodologies. They will be obliged to differentiate the ratings of complex instruments. They will not be able to use the same sort of rating scale for straightforward corporate credit and for securitizations in the future. And there will be some quite intrusive internal monitoring of the way the rating agencies operate. The US uh, has got something slightly different, but you know, it goes in the same direction. But you know, in spite of all of this, actually, um, there is no increased competition in the rating agency business. That we had no new entrants, in spite of a lot of fuss. Well, one or two in China, who, interestingly enough, give higher ratings to the Chinese government than the um, U.S. Ra rating agencies do. Uh, the issue of pays model remains there. Nobody's found a viable alternative to that. Uh, at the moment, in the U.S., structured investments are still rated on the same scale as vanilla bonds, although they will have to be different in, in Europe. And, you know, they still play a central role in capital regulation in spite of the weaknesses that were demonstrated. Regulators still use them as the basis for a lot of the uh, calibration of capital requirements. Then a brief um, detour into the EU. Uh, what was the problem that emerged in the EU and has it been dealt with? Well, the problem in the EU was well, the hardest the problem of the Icelandic banks. And you may say, uh, those of you who know about these things, excuse me, Iceland isn't in the EU, to which your answer is right, but nor is Switzerland, but they are in the European Economic Area. And the European Economic Area is actually the relevant geographical entity for financial regulation. Not for the currency, of course, but for financial regulation, they're all signed up to the same directives. And if you are authorized in any one country in the EEA, you may, without further approval, take deposits in any other country of the EEA. So if you're approved in Iceland as a bank by the Icelandic FSA, um, backed by the Icelandic Central Bank, you can take deposits in London or in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, the Icelandic banks did so. And they aggressively looked for retail deposits to fund a massive expansion in property lending uh, around, not so much in Iceland, a lot of it was in the UK. Um, and then when they went bust, because they were too big, I mean, they were, each of them had a balance sheet that was at least 12 times the size of Icelandic GDP, and there were three of them. Uh, that, that it was quite clear that the, the, Icelandic, the backing of the Icelandic Central Bank was essentially meaningless. I mean, it couldn't bail them out. Uh, they just have the money. So the UK government had to bail out depositors in Icelandic banks. And so the government and a lot of other people said, hey, just a minute. You know, how can it be that we have to bail out a bank which we didn't approve, which we had no uh, regulatory oversight of? Well, political answer to that was quite clear because, you know, they didn't want uh, many tens of thousands of people besieging Downing Street, which is what would have happened if they'd told them they'd lost all their money. Uh, interestingly, Ice Save was the BBC's number one tip for where to put your money. 
the day before it went bust. And um, so the government did bail them out and has since been suing the Icelandic government, which is pretty much of a waste of time as they haven't got any money. But anyway, that's what's going on. So people say, well, they've got to do something else here. Cause the, so the answer is we've got to have either um, more Europe, in other words, more pan-European regulation, or we've got to have less Europe. In other words, people can't just take deposits without local approval. We've got to do one or the other. Uh, and in the typical European fashion, we've chosen to do something in between. Um, and this is a kind of a, you know, it's the same kind of issue as the, as the Eurozone issue. You know, there's a sort of will to have a single financial market, but there isn't the will to have the powers at the center to, to manage that financial market. So we now have three new authorities, as they were called. They were previously called just committees. There's the European Securities and Markets Authority, which is in Paris, your Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority in Frankfurt, and the Banking Authority in London, carefully chosen so they can communicate well with each other, uh, and a European Systemic Risk Board on top. But these authorities are authorities in name only. They do not, they are not the regulator. The, the regulator is still the national um, regulator. What they are supposed to be able to do is, as it were, arbitrate in disputes between regulators. So in theory, in future, supposing an Icelandic uh, bank were uh, offering high deposit rates um, for retail depositors in the UK and taking in a lot of money and the FSA didn't like it, they could go to the EBA and they say, stop this, you know, because we're, these people are hoovering up deposits and you know, they can't back them and we're not, we don't like it. So there will be, you know, they could then and they'd have to haul in the Icelanders and say, what the hell are you up to? So whether it will work or not, I don't know. But it's still, I'm afraid, just like on the euro, it's a halfway house. Finally, the culture of regulation, has it changed? And here, uh, there's an interesting set of uh, debates going on about it. Um, and I think that Dare Turner, my successor at the FSA, has put it, put it very well. You know, he has basically argued that the mindset of regulators, and I think this is true having been there myself, was up until the crisis, and I think you know, everybody shared this, it's not really different in other places around the world, was, well, look, you know, markets are broadly efficient. We all know that. We all learned it at business school. Um, and you know, therefore, it's not for regulators to say, if there are willing buyers and willing sellers, um, that these prices are crazy. You know, it's not... I mean, it's a free market out there, and it's for financial institutions to defend the interests of their shareholders, and, you know, how can regulators come and sort of second-guess what is going on in markets? And that would be the kind of Greenspan view, and Greenspan, in this respect anyway, issued a great recantation in the, uh, at the height of the crisis where he said, those of us who believed in the interests of shareholders and boards of directors to defend their interests are in the state of shock disbelief because you know, they were doing things which were remarkable and completely eccentric. And so that has altered the mindset of regulation. It has certainly altered uh, political views. That is clearly true in the US. It's clearly true in the UK. It's even more true just at the moment in Switzerland um, you know, that the banks are not exactly at the top of everybody's guest list. You know, probably the biggest single indicator of this is that you know, if you look at the UK honours lists and see who's getting the knighthoods, there are no bankers anymore. Um, and that is, uh, there aren't any Légion d'honneur being handed out. I don't know what the Swiss equivalent of the Légion d'honneur is, but I guess that probably the board of UBS are not getting it, whatever it is. Um, so this is a change in culture. So when we used to have politicians saying, oh, we operate a light-touch regime in London or in... Zurich or in New York, we want to attract your business, you know, we will be a congenial environment for mobile financial business. We're now saying intrusive, you know, if you come out and say we're, uh, we are an intrusive regulator, you get a good headline. Uh, whereas regulators were told that they had to think very hard about competitiveness, that imposing regulations that were tougher than um, other places would be dangerous because you would push business elsewhere, you know, they're now saying, well, you know, if we do push business elsewhere, that's a price worth paying. The Bank of England said that explicitly. And if we have higher regulation in the UK, and the Swiss have said the same, uh, you know, they want super equivalence, i.e. higher than 
Basel III. And if that causes some of the business to go somewhere else, well, you know, thank you and good night. That's fine. Um, that's a big change. Um, in the past, on innovation, regulators broadly said, it's okay, you can innovate, you can devise new products, unless we say you can't. So we'll have a look, and if we think they're really dangerous, we'll stop you. But now, it's absolutely the opposite. You know, don't think about innovating unless you've got regulatory approval. It's not okay unless they say so. And in terms of people in the system, in the past, there was a kind of backstop view about who could be on the board of a bank or the board of an insurance company, which was that they had to be fit and proper, which means, which meant, you know, you hadn't been in jail, at least not often and not recently. Um, <laughs> but now the focus is on competence. Um, that, and in, in London anyway, which has probably gone further in this dimension than anybody else, you know, if you want to go and be the director of a bank or of an insurance company, you will now be interviewed by the FSA and interviewed uh, about your competence. And they ask what particular function you're going to perform on the board. Are you going to be on the audit committee or the risk committee or whatever? And you will be quizzed on it. I have personal experience of this. It's happened to me. Um, and that is altering in quite a big way uh, the sort of people you're getting on the boards of institutions and altering the way in which people think about their responsibilities on boards because they've got particular functions pinned on them by the regulator. But how long will this last? That's the big question, of course, because, you know, there is going to be pressure. You can already see it a little bit politically in the US with the Republicans saying, well, hang on, you know, are we not going too far with all of this uh, Dodd-Frank stuff and trying to rewrite some of it? and pull back, and do we really want to kick business out of New York or whatever? And, you know, there is a, already some signs of the political consensus around this changed approach fraying uh, at the edges. Uh, but that's uncertain, and, you know, every uh, accident that happens in the financial sector sort of alters the balance. You know, up until the latest UBS road trader, there were starting to be signs, even in Switzerland, that people saying, well, you know, and then, God. God, they go. No, that's the pendulum swings back again the other way, and so it's a very, it's a very fragile new consensus, I would say, um, uh, and we'll just have to see how it, how it develops. So those are my ten areas. In a sense, most of them are ones where it's not completely clear. My conclusion is that a lot of progress has been made on, particularly on capital regulation, but it's not yet been implemented, of course. So we don't know how, how it'll work that macro prudential regulation has been agreed in principle, practicality is not clarified. Too big to fail, as I've explained, remains a very open question uh, around the globe. Um, there are problem, transatlantic problems on derivatives and credit rating agencies, and shadow banking, which is the elephant in the room, I think, has not been addressed properly uh, so far. So it's uh, a glass half full or a glass half empty, I would say. Uh, and remains a very interesting area to monitor. So my aim uh, has been to you know, give you uh, an audit of where I think we are and to give you some pointers to the kinds of things to look out for if you're interested in this area in the next uh, months and years. Look out for what's going on on shadow banking. Look out for whether countries are really implementing Basel III in the form uh, agreed, look out for what politicians are saying about the kind of character of regulation and the degree to which they want regulatory competition between centres. Uh, and it's a fascinating area now because it's a strange mixture of financial theory uh, and brute politics, um, which I always think are slightly more interesting uh, than just uh, looking at risk-weighted assets and leverage ratios. Thank you. Thank you, Howard, for Sorry, a very a stimulating longer. conversation um, and for getting us through a 12-week course in a little over an hour, which is uh, <laughs> very good. Well done. Can we open up the floor to uh, questions? Um, I know there's quite a few. Yes, please, if you just identify yourself, there's some microphones as well if you'd like to, to step up. Hello. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. My name is George Norris. I'm working with the British High Commission here in Singapore. I'm the economist for Southeast Asia. 
it seems to me there's a lot of pain being taken by the taxpayers, um, by the regulators, by everybody in the world, except by the bankers themselves, who are still paying themselves very well, fighting every inch of the way against the increased regulation. Um, and I, I ask you, because we saw Northern Rock, you, let, um, you wanted to let go bankrupt, I think, in the UK. My question is, do you think we should have let some of those banks, more of those banks, go bankrupt so that the moral hazard problem would be better addressed? Thank you. Um, well, um, that would have gone down well at the Labour Party conference uh, last week. But um, uh, I don't think it's actually true to say that uh, the bankers have got off uh, completely, actually. I mean, uh, pay is uh, on its way down in Wall Street. The difficulty about this is that, um, you know, the top traders in Goldman's used to get $40 million a year, and they're now getting 15. They think that's pretty bad news. You probably think that's still quite a lot. Um, and you're right. <laughs> but, but, I mean, you know, let's be clear, it has changed quite a lot. And, in fact, if uh, the amounts that these people have earned in, in now are, for the last few years, is basically nothing, because the options are worth nothing. So let's be clear, there is not no pain to bankers, because anybody who's been paid in options, which many of them have been, the options are so far underwater that you can forget about them. They are worthless. Um, you know, that's... Uh, I mean, Morgan Stanley, which I happen to know, most people, you know, if their options are uh, 40 to $50, and the share price is currently 13 50 you know. So, I mean, it's just a mile away. So it's not true to say that they haven't taken any, any pain. The issue of, um, of sort of, ba of uh, um, bankruptcy, and um, I think the, the you know, the, the problem is that it feels great to say, all right, sod it, you're going bust. And it'll, it feels great until the following morning, you know, when you then have to start to pick up the pieces. And then you discover that the act of doing that has created collateral damage all over the market, and your costs are even higher than if you hadn't. So the purpose of the resolution mechanisms um, and the living wills, and perhaps I should have said more about this, this is the area which, where the attempt to answer your question is perhaps being made, which is that... If a bank runs into trouble, then there should be a method of regulators stepping in earlier, you know, stepping in before five to midnight or five past midnight, which has typically been, been the case. In other words, you set the capital sufficiently high and you have a requirement that if you don't, if you go slightly below the minimum requirement, then the regulator or the, you know, the authorities of the central bank or the resolution authority, which is probably the central bank, will step in and seize you, okay? And at that point, shareholders wiped out and management wiped out. The bank is still there and it exists to service its depositors and its bondholders, etc. but you've just wiped out the, the, the equity interest and you've wiped out the management. And that is quite a credible threat, I think. And that is focusing minds in the banking system in quite a big way because this could happen, you know, significantly before the moment when you've gone bust. And that's what you want to happen. You want something which allows you to step in before it's too late. And that's the aim of these resolution mechanisms. So I personally think that is probably the best and most credible way of dealing with the moral hazard problem. Because any other way does risk getting into the cutting off of your nose to spite your face territory. Um, because you may say you won't step in, but when it comes to it, politically you may be forced to. So nobody quite believes that you will. But if you have this mechanism whereby you can step in but keep the bank running, um, then I think that's much more attractive and much more credible as a threat. Thanks. There's a question just over there. My name is Ruben Hintz. I'm a graduate student here at the Lee Kuan Yew School. You mentioned the shift from the G7 to the G20. How do you see all these Asian countries with their rapidly growing economies affecting the future landscape, if at all? Yeah. Well, that is a very, very um, good question, and um, uh, which is what speakers say when they don't quite know how to answer it. Um, 
But the, I don't know how to answer it very well, but I don't, I don't feel too apologetic about it because I don't think we really know. I mean, I wrote a book about central uh, banks, um, which was pub also published in the beginning of 2010. And I went uh, around interviewing a lot of um, central bankers, including uh, Zhao Xiaochuan of the People's Bank. And I specifically asked him in the interview, he's an easy person to talk to, I said, and this was just pre, this was 2008, actually, I did the interviews. And I said to him, you know, it, what, what is China's attitude? Now, there you are, huge banking system, huge growth in financial markets, and yet you're not in the G7, you're not in the Basel Committee, you're not in the G10 governors. Uh, um, I said, surely, you know, aren't you pressing to, to be in these things? And his answer, which is the government's line at the time, he said, no, 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 we're not, we're not pressing. You know, we're getting on. We need to focus on our own systems. You know, we're improving our own systems. We want our banks to be competitive. We want them to meet global standards. But that's our focus. And as for, you know, getting involved in these things, well, maybe it'll happen one day, but we are not pressing for it. It was very clear, totally straightforward. And then within six months, they were, they were members. <laughs> and, and that was a crisis-driven thing. So I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's at all uh, critical of the Chinese to say they don't really know. I mean, you know, Chinese, they're, they're thoughtful people. They, they think about these things, but they don't know because they suddenly happen. It's a party, you know, so why have you come to this party? Well, I, only, I, happened, I was wandering by, I saw the door open, I've come in. You know, I mean, that's what's happened, really. And I think they're starting to work out what they actually want. Now, at the moment in Basel, they are being quite aggressive, actually, on, in the sense of, being, fa being on the side of those arguing for high capital. I mean, it, everybody knows that, that you know, there's a bit of a spectrum of opinion in the Basel Committee. The UK and the Swiss have tended to be fairly aggressive. Uh, the Americans sort of in the middle. French have been on the other extreme. The, the Chinese have been kind of more towards the British and Swiss end of the debate because it's not that long ago that China had a lot of non-performing loans in, the, in their banking system. You know, they had to spend expensively recapitalize their banking system. And they kind of know that there's still a risk premium in China in spite of the size of their financial system now and that it makes sense for them to say we're whiter than white. You know, we are above. So they've gone. They've gone to all their banks and said Basel III is your minimum, but actually in China it's Basel III plus one. And so, you know, that's what, that's what we want. Not as aggressive as the Swiss, Swiss quite, but, but fairly much out there and, and telling their banks to get on with it quicker than the time scale, you know, they've, everybody's in theory got till 2019, but they're saying we want it done by year after next. So, you know, at the moment, they are, that's the game they're playing. But there are, you know, interesting little side developments. You've got the growth of summits from the BRICS, you know, getting together regularly and trying to agree common positions in front of the G20. I'm slightly cynical about that. I wonder whether the Chinese interests and the Russian interests are really, you know, that closely aligned. I'm not, it's not clear to me that they are. Uh, but, they, you know, the, the BRICS are, are meeting and sort of apparently discussing these things and supposedly trying to come to common positions. I don't know quite where that'll end. So I think this is, a, you know, an uncertain position. At the moment, you know, everybody I, I meet and... I ask about this question, say, well, these new members, either some of them have been quite quiet or, you know, they've been fairly much aligned with, um, you know, where we, where we were before. I mean, they've not, they've not come on and said, why are we doing all this? You know, they've not sort of just tried to sort of rock the boat. They've tended to align themselves with the sort of core opinion on, on this reform program. So, so far, so good, I'd say. But, you know, I, watch, this, watch this space. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Su Yan Chi. I'm from Barclays. Um, perhaps this question could be easier to be answered. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are, or your peers, when you know recently Donald Tsang um, mentioned that he has no problems if any of the foreign banks were to relocate some of the head offices to Hong Kong. And you see a lot of developments in the regulatory field, the policy field in the US and Europe, and at the back of that, you know, what do regulators in the West look when you suddenly have Asia, and this is not quite sudden, it's been going on for a couple of years. Um, for example, in OTC derivatives, the, the urge now for every Asian country to set up their own uh, 
central clearing platforms. And that fragments the whole entire risk picture for most regulators around the world, which you know, contradicts what you were trying to get at, which is more transparency. So if you were a regulator in the West and the global markets are very interconnected and you're seeing now Asia, you know, the potential of all this happening in Asia, um, what would you consider? Given that they don't have the traditional, you know, bastions of infrastructure, the legal uh, frameworks and all that, to deal with such absorption capacity for large universal banks in their own Asian domestic markets? Yeah. Well, that's a, another very interesting question. I mean, the... Um, uh, I don't think at the moment that uh, the regulatory arbitrage point that I referred to, you know, as a, as a threat, is particularly evident on the straightforward capital point. You know, I don't see uh, any uh, significant jurisdictions, you know, that could be attractive to a big bank like Barclays saying, come here and you can have 3% less capital. I don't think that's happening. Now, it could, but for the moment, I think, that would be, that would be unacceptable. And probably, I'm, so, I'm certain Bob Diamond would, your boss, would decide that this wasn't a smart thing to do anyway. Because almost certainly the market would punish you. Uh, in, in the co your cost of your debt would, would rise if you know, Barclays shifted in order to avoid two or three percent of capital. You know, I think that would just not be a, a clever calculation at the present time. The structural question, however, the too big to fail issue, is a different one because that is not a straightforward question of kind of tighter or looser. You know, there are genuinely different views about whether separating, carving up a bank like yours makes sense from the point of view of financial stability. You know, there are people who argue perfectly, uh, you know, with integrity, I think, not just from their own book, that, that it doesn't make sense that actually Barclays is better diversified, you know, as a diversified institution with one side maybe supporting the other side and that after all Barclays survived through the crisis without having to be bailed out, um, uh, except perhaps expensively by Qatar, but I mean not by any taxpayer anyway. Um, so I think that's a much more moot point. And I think if, um, uh, you know, if Barclays moved for that reason, you know, the markets might well accept that and say, well, you know, that's fair enough. Uh, I'm slightly sceptical about whether, quite whether Donald Chang is so enthusiastic, you know, would be so enthusiastic when he got to look at it um, in terms of the obligations that Hong Kong would be taking on. Um, because, you know, they would then be the home supervisor and potentially the lender of last resort for what is, a, you know, still a very big retail bank in the, in the UK. And I just wonder whether they'd be really enthusiastic about that. Um, so, I don't know. But I, I, I do think that that is a perfectly possible, uh, possible outcome. So I don't see it as an, a way of avoiding capital, but I do see it potentially as a way of avoiding being split up. I think we have one more question there. I, I just want to turn, uh, Howard, again to this too big to fail uh, argument and actually suggest that perhaps it's not as, as moot um, as all that uh, in the sense that we have examples of uh, financial services industry uh, that can be perfectly innovative, risk-taking, you know, can do all kinds of, of uh, weird and wonderful stuff and make money for... Uh, for its principles. I'm, I'm talking about the hedge fund industry, uh, which to my knowledge has not had a uh, too big to fail sort of moment unless you count long-term capital management um, about 10 years ago. Uh, we've also had examples in the, you know, in the recent past of utility banks or utility type financial institutions being perfectly able to sort of fulfill their mandate uh, used to call them building societies in the in the UK. So, you know this this idea that somehow uh, investment banking and retail banking, um, you know, fit well together. And um, you know, I, I think it's it's somewhat pie in the sky. And I want to go back to a comment you made earlier, or at the beginning of your talk, which is that this, at the end of the day, is a political economy issue. That you've got institutions that have. Uh, enjoyed essentially a sovereign guarantee um, 
have been making quite a bit of money and they really don't want um, to see that uh, guarantee being taken away from them. So I wonder if you have uh, any comments on that. Mm. Well, I, Stavros, I don't really disagree with what you, what you say. And, you know, if you could have a sovereign guarantee for no particular penalty, um, then why would you not want to keep it? Uh, so I can see why banks want to keep it. The, the, the difficulty I have about this debate is this, that the moment you can get applause and approval and nods around the room if you say, we must ensure that never again will taxpayers have to step in to bail out these institutions. Everybody nods and says, that's absolutely great. Actually, I don't agree, personally, because I think that if you really wish to make the financial system completely immune to failure, that will cost you an arm and leg. I mean, it will just be you know, the amount of capital you have to have to guarantee that at no point will you actually ever need to, be, to have the taxpayer standing behind you. And it's rational, actually, for us as a, as a society to say, it's a bit in the same way that governments offer catastrophe insurance, you know, that, and terrorism insurance. If you said you've got to insure yourself against a terrorism threat, you know, there'd never be another international art show, for example. There never would be. You couldn't afford to send a painting around the world. You know, that all kinds of things would simply stop. Governments do back up, and every now and again, those guarantees are called, and you go, oh, well, but the balance, you know, the the benefit you get from this activity taking place is probably outweighs the occasional time that you have to bail out. So I don't think it makes sense to try to think of a system which is, it, which is completely impossible, where, where, where failure is completely impossible. I think you have to accept there's some probability. After all, you know, in the UK, we did have to bail out Northern Rock. We hadn't had to bail one out since 1858, you know, which wasn't that bad, really. I mean, obviously, it's not great when you do it, but it's not a bad run in a pretty volatile financial market, you know, to have not to have a bailout, not to have a bank run before then. So I think that, you know, you're in a shades of grey. I don't like these very um, ideological positions that this must never happen, we must totally remove it, etc. I don't think you're in that. You're in a shades of grey world. So do I, have to, however, think that we ran the system too close to the bone? Yes, we did. And I think we didn't realize we were doing because we had a very long up cycle and we'd sort of convinced ourselves, you know, from the famous Gordon Brown phrase that he'd put an end to boom and bust, you know, uh, a phrase he wishes he'd never said, obviously. But, you know, I think we did. I don't think he was the only person who thought that, that somehow we'd got better at all of this. But now we've, we can see we're in an environment of extraordinary volatility. You know, uh, when just look at what, you know, the share price of the French banks went down 30% last week and have gone up 40% this week. I mean, you know, this is unbelievable, really. So we're in an astonishing, you know, uh, volatile market. And in those circumstances, you've got to, you, you must uh, protect the system more by requiring it to be at least safer. But I think the... Uh, the holy grail of saying you get to a point where you will never, ever have to intervene again is not going to happen. So you're in, a, you're in a shades of grey world. Personally, I've got to say, I am reasonably attracted to the vicar's ideas because I think they're flexible enough to cope with uh, different business models. Um, I think that they probably do draw the line in a reasonable place in terms of saying, well, these are the areas which are, which are really important for the functioning of the economy, and therefore we will have a, you know, we are more likely to, to bail them out, as long, and though we want particular capital attached to them, that we don't, you know, we're not necessarily saying you can't do other things, but what you can't do is cross-subsidise from this way to that way. You could do from that way to this way, but you can't do from this way to that way. That doesn't strike me as being an absurd solution. I think it may have been oversold because I think the idea that you would never bail out the ones on the other side is probably unrealistic. You might have to. Uh, but I, I do think it has got something to commend it as a kind of middle way in this area. Oh, there's a lady just by the microphone there. Yes. Uh, good evening. Sorry. Uh, my name is Katalin Bokor. I'm working for the EU Commission here in Singapore. I'm also a former Science for student. Uh, 
Uh, and I <laughs> have just a short question. I was wondering if you would add the big four as the 11th element of your list. Thank you. Um, not really. No. Um, I, um, I mean, it's unfortunate that we don't have more competition in auditing. Uh, and partly that's to do with the way the US handled the Arthur Anderson thing, which I think was very bad um, by the Justice Department prosecuting them for a criminal offense, which they never proved, but that caused the failure of the firm, so we reduced competition. I also think that the auditing profession uh, did not cover itself with glory under the, uh, in auditing things like Lehman Brothers, you know, they got, um, in July of 2008, Lehman Brothers got a clean opinion by its auditors saying it was a going concern, no problem at all. Um, and it, we now know that it was shifting assets backwards and forwards. Um, and, you know, in September it had gone completely bust. So I don't think the auditors were particularly useful. But I'm not personally enthusiastic, I've got to say, about the proposal that the Commission uh, is coming out with for joint auditing. I mean, this is the thing that goes on in France and Italy. I've never, I've never really seen that it's uh, particularly useful. Uh, I can't see that it's going to improve the quality of, uh, of audits. I personally think, you know, you've just got to downgrade the audit. I, I don't think you pay much attention to audits, frankly. I think they're rather formulaic. And I think we probably exaggerate the importance and the, you know, what they can, what they can actually do. It's a bit like rating agencies, I think. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that I'm not very enthusiastic about um, uh, Commissioner Barnier's proposal. Great, thank you. We're actually running a little bit over time, but I know there's just one more question there, and then we'll just have to close it down. So please. I come at this um, from a layman perspective, but I was really struck when you said that the lexicon went from fit and proper to competent. And as someone who doesn't understand this stuff, I'm consistently surprised when people say that no one actually understood this stuff, that derivatives were so complicated that no one knew what they were doing, that the ratings agency didn't know what they were assigning labels to. And my question is, are there enough good people that are good enough? to do the incredible amount of regulation that needs to happen, and also the role of technology in making things so beyond complicated for people to process. Yeah. Well, there is a big human capital problem uh, in the regulatory uh, industry. And, um, you know, one, uh, in these difficult employment markets in Europe and the US, the best advice you can give someone these days is go and become a financial regulator or a compliance person or a risk manager because the market for them is booming. Um, and uh, don't go and be a trader, you know. But, uh, so uh, there, is a, there is a big issue, and I think regulators are um, faced with uh, a problem of whether they can attract uh, staff who are competent to understand these things. The... Um, and the response is, you know, being is rather straightforward um, in in the UK certainly. I mean, the salaries in, reg in the regulator are going up. In the US, they are not, because the US has got this, you know, problem that they believe that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I mean, as you know, US civil servants are paid very, very, very badly, and um, as a result, they have massively high turnover, and their regulatory system is less competent as a result. I mean, I think two years ago, the SEC, the turnover in the SEC's New York office was 70% in a year. Uh, well, you know, I don't think how you can run an office that way. I mean, it's impossible. And the only way the US system runs is by people coming in and out. You know, so people spend a couple of years in the SEC and then they go back to one of the firms, you know, that because they can't afford to spend any time there because the salaries are ridiculously low. Uh, so I think there's a really big issue in the United States. Um, it's not the case so much in the UK. It's certainly not the case in places like Singapore and Hong Kong, where they have a much more enlightened attitude and they have market-related pay for regulators. And I think they get benefit from that. Uh, you know, the HKMA and the MAS and the SFC are very competent regulators, uh, done quite well. And part of it, I think, is because they... You know, they are prepared to pay. They never, they never pay top dollar, you know, because you never can chase investment bank bonuses. But the salary relativities are much closer in markets like Singapore and Hong Kong 
than they are in the, uh, in the US. So I do think that um, the US has got a problem particularly, uh, and that people do have to recognize that if you want a more sophisticated, intrusive regime focused on competence, they're gonna have to pay for it. You know, that you're going to have to have different people because you're making different kinds of judgments. You know, judging whether someone's fit and proper is a question of ticking a box. You know, have they been convicted of fraud? Have they been to jail? Literally, that's what it is. Whereas if it's interviewing people and assessing their competence to be on an audit committee of a bank, that's a different kind of question, and different sorts of people and different sorts of skills are required. So, yeah, you're absolutely on the button. There is a need for a major upskilling of the regulatory network around the world. Howard, as always, thank you for a very stimulating presentation and series of questions, and we greatly look forward to your uh, engagement next time, and what will, I hope, be a two or three hour lecture to get in that two or three series of <laughs> courses you offer at uh, Ciencias Po. Everyone, please join me in thanking Howard Davies. <laughs>